Welcome back to our summer study of ancient philosophy. This is lecture eight on Republic's book three and four. We're gonna have a fun time discussing the nature of the guardians. Plato, after discussing the guardians, is gonna be able to locate the virtues in the city. We're gonna find justice, discover on Plato's view what justice is in the city. And then Plato is gonna do some moral psychology. We're gonna talk about the nature of the human person. And then we're going to see what justice in the human person amounts to. So it's going to be a fun conversation. So let's go ahead and start off with an overview of the Republic. All right. So I want to remind you about the, I want to remind you of the overall argument in the Republic. So we want to keep this in mind. So as we're getting into some of the particular details, sort of we can see the big structure and see what's going on. So recall we looked earlier at the reconstruction of the main argument in the Republic that Nicholas Pappas provided in his nice guidebook to the Republic. So the first premise is that both the individual and the city comprise forces potentially at odds with one another. And this is right squarely in our reading, so books two through four. So we want to look at that. We want to try to understand what the justification is for that claim. In the later books, which we'll study next week, Plato will argue that for both, justice consists in harmony among those forces, and then in the latter books, 8 and 9, we find that when both are not in harmony among those forces, the result is unhappiness. And the greater the inharmony, the greater the conflict, the greater the anarchy, and the greater the misery. So you get the conclusion that justice is profitable. Now what I want to do is look back at a, a part of book 2 that we didn't highlight in the previous lecture. So recall in book two, we start off constructing the ideal city. And let's look at this passage on 370 A and B. So they are talking about um, the, they're talking about the origins of the city. And they note that people aren't self-sufficient, so we need one another. And so we need to construct the city from the beginning. We need to figure out what people what, what kind of jobs there will be in the city that people need. So in 370 A and B, Socrates and Edematus are talking about what kinds of individuals you'll have in the city. And he says that, what about this? Must each of them contribute his own work for the common use of all? For example, will a farmer provide food for everyone, spending quadruple the time and labor to produce food to be shared by them all? Or will he not bother about that, producing one quarter the food in one quarter of the time and spending the other three quarters, one in building a house, one in the production of clothes, and one in making shoes, not troubling to associate with others, but minding his own business? So Edematus and Socrates continue to think about that, and they say, well, look, it, it would be much easier if a person specialized in a particular task and spent all their time producing, for example, food for everyone. And then a shoemaker could you know, produce shoes and, a, and a, a builder could produce you know, houses and so on. Right? So they say, yeah, that would certainly be easier. And then notice what Socrates says. He said, yeah, okay, yeah, that's right. Um, but note that in the first place, we aren't all born alike, but each of us differs somewhat in nature from the others, one being suited to one task, another to another. Right, so here Socrates is introducing this idea that when we think about human people, we can see that the aptitudes for various tasks differ from one another. And he says, second, does not one person do a better job if he practices many crafts, or since he's one person himself if he practices one? So the idea there is like it would be better for a person to practice just one task, one job, right, that you uh, get to be better right, at that. So this is the one job principle that we're going to talk about in today's lecture. Plato is putting forward the idea that each person has one particular job that they're qualified for, one particular job that they have an aptitude for. And so we'll see how this principle um, carries out in the Republic. It's, it's a very important principle, so we want to see it at the beginning. So let's look at this other passage that we find in 374b. So he says here that we've prevented a cobbler from trying to be a farmer, weaver, or builder at the same time and said that he must remain a cobbler in order to produce 
find work. So again, establishing this one principle, one job principle. And each of the others, too, was to work all his life at a single trade for which he had a natural aptitude and keep away from all others so as not to miss the right moment to practice his own work well. And so, right, they realize that since the city that they're building, recall from the previous lecture, is going to have delicacies, it's going to have very fine crafts and arts, it's going to be desirable for other cities to take and plunder those goods. So they're going to have to have a class of people that will defend them. And this is where the guardians arise. So Plato spends the most time talking about the guardians. The idea that why he spends the most time talking about the guardians is that the other parts of the city people are very familiar with. So they're familiar with farmers and cobblers and shoemakers and artisans and so on. And Plato doesn't want to change that. Rather, what he wants to do is he wants to establish an ideal city that's going to be ruled by a new special class of people. These are the guardians. And so this is why the guardians get the most attention. And it's quite extensive attention in, in the Republic. And there's some really interesting things going on here, which we'll talk about. So last time we did highlight that the traits of the guardians are going to be people that have ideal rage and ideal quiescence. They are individuals that are warrior-like. They will frighten the enemies. They will show no mercy to the enemies, but at the same time they won't attack their own citizens, so they'll be friendly to their own citizens. Plato here is assuming that there is a nature that establishes or a nature that has both these ideal qualities within them. That's why when we looked at last time the analogy with the pedigree, with the dog of good pedigree, was important for Plato. He wants to think this is possible, it is possible to have individuals like this. Now, in order to get these individuals, you have to work with both human nature, and as we'll see in a minute, Plato thinks that there are different kinds of natures. There are the gold natures, the silver natures, the bronze natures, the iron natures, and the guardians are going to have the best nature. But then that nature has to be cultivated and shaped, and so it's going to be shaped by education. And here's where Plato pr produces, here's where Plato gives his overall account of what uh, education amounts to. Right, so again, the overarching idea is that education is a way of cultivating an individual's thoughts and patterns that um, enable them to perform the function that, that Plato thinks they ought to perform. He does spend a lot of time talking about poetry, which is interesting. We saw earlier that he thinks that in some cases where a lie would benefit the city, that that lie is called for. It's a useful falsehood. Remember, the goal here is that Plato's thinking that, that the stories are going to habituate people to act in certain kinds of ways, and so it's important that the state controls the story. Now, there is this passage that I want to look at on imitation, which is really interesting. The Greek word there is mimesis, and the idea is that it's kind of play acting, and Plato is very interested in what happens to an individual as they play out different characters. So... In particular, he's focused on this question, should the guardians engage in imitation? So let's look at this passage on 394e. So consider, Ademetus, whether our guardians should be imitators or not. Or does this also follow from our earlier statement that each individual would do a fine job of one occupation, not many, and that if he tried the latter and dabbled in many things, he'd surely fail to achieve distinction in any of them? So again, we have this one job principle, and Plato thinks here that there's something inconsistent about, about acting, about trying on different emotions and traits that is inconsistent with sort of having this laser-like exclusive focus on what you're supposed to do. And so they think, no, you know, the guardians shouldn't be able to imitate, right? They should focus on what, what they are supposed to be doing. So he says here, this is on 395D, that imitations practiced from youth become part of nature and settle into habits of gesture, voice, and thought. Then we want to allow those, he continues, for whom we profess to care, and who must grow into good men to imitate, either a young woman, or an older one, or one abusing her husband, quarreling with the gods, or bragging because she thinks herself happy, or suffering misfortune, and possessed by the sorrows and lamentations. And even less, one who is ill, in love, or in labor. So Plato's really concerned here that the guardians don't imitate what you might think of as bad thoughts or bad emotions, because the guardians are supposed to perform a very special function. 
we'll get to in a minute, you know, Plato's thoughts about civil unrest. And so he is concerned to show that the guardians are good rulers and the guardians are possible. It's possible to describe right, an educational strategy that will bring about these individuals that will go to war with the city's en enemies, protect the city's citizens, and not plunder their wealth. So it's interesting to see you know, whether this is possible. We'll, we'll get um, a taste of that in Demetrius' question here in a bit. So one last thing I want to point, point out at the bottom of this discussion of uh, mimesis, he says, you know, perhaps you don't think that it harmonizes with our constitution. This is a mixed style of music because no one in our city is two or more people simultaneously since each does only one job. This is again 397E. So I just want to highlight there again this one job principle. It's really so Plato continues to talk about the education of the guardians. He's going to spend a lot of time thinking about music and gymnastics. So it's important to realize here that music isn't just, you know, how we think of music. It comes from the Greek word musike, which means any kind of activity that's sponsored by the muses. So this includes poetry, dance, astronomy, history, philosophy, and so on. Right? So really when he's thinking about music and gymnastics, he's thinking about how we would consider all of education. So the Guardian's education, remember, it has a very important function. It's to make them enlightened enough so that they have the right kind of moral sentiments, aesthetic sentiments, so that they don't attack their own citizens. But we don't want to make them too soft. You don't want to inculcate in them a love for delicacy so that they will no longer go to war with their enemies. We want them to be frightening to our enemies. If you're using the dog analogy, you want them to be friendly right, to your children and aggressive to unknown individuals that may try to enter the house. Now I want to look at a passage here where he's talking about how rhythm and music and poetry should mix because you get this idea that there is a moral benefit to the experience of the arts. So he says, for these reasons, Glaucon, that uh, education in music and poetry are really important. First, because rhythm and harmony permeate the inner part of the soul more than anything else affecting it most strongly and bringing it grace. So that if someone is properly educated in music and poetry, it makes him graceful, and if not, then the opposite. Interesting idea that education in music and poetry permeates the individual so that the quality, in a way, of the rhythm, the quality of the words comes to sort of reflect in that individual soul. Second, because anyone who has been properly educated in music and poetry will sense it acutely when someone has, when something has been omitted from a thing and when it hasn't been finely crafted or finely made by nature. And since he has the, has the right distaste, he'll praise fine things, be pleased by them, receive them into his soul, and being nurtured by them become fine and good. He'll rightly object to what is shameful, hating it, while he's still young and unable to grasp the reason. But having been educated in this way, he will welcome the reason when it comes and recognize it easily because of his kinship with himself. So Plato is thinking that education is really important because we want to breed these kind of qualities in the guardians. Now, he wants to separate the guardians from concerns about economic interest. They're not going to be paid. They will have all their needs met. They're not going to be able to have private families. Uh, they will have wives in common. Uh, children of those arrangements will be, in a way, hidden, so people won't know whose child um, is whose. Right? Plato's thinking, trying to describe the guardians as people who are, in a way, moved purely by moral and aesthetic experience that do not, do not have the kind of private attachments that cultivate these desires for wealth and possessions, because as we'll see in a minute, Plato thinks that wealth and possessions lie at the root of civil unrest. And so he's very concerned that the guardians are removed uh, from those interests, which all sort of raises the question about whether or not this guardian class is actually possible. So we move now from the education of the guardians to thinking about the complete political plan for the ideal city. So the idea is that the guardians rule and the productive citizens, the citizens that are involved in the market of the city, produce the goods that they produce. 
important to just stress again, right? Plato is trying to separate out the rulers of the city from those concerned with the production and maintenance of wealth. Now, the question here, the problem really for Plato's view, is why don't the guardians, who do not have private possessions and wealth, they have the, the military power of the state, why do they just, why don't they plunder the wealth of the private citizens? What prevents them from doing that? Now, we've seen in part Plato's solution with proper education. The idea is that the guardians will be trained in music, in poetry, in knowledge, in philosophy, so that they'll have the right kind of temperament that they will not want to attack their citizens. And yet, right, this is a warrior class of individuals. We want them to go to war with cities that try to attack us. And so they are definitely going to have these military tendencies. And so what's going to prevent them uh, from, you know, at some point in time attacking the citizens? And here, it's interesting. Here, Plato says that there is going to be a myth that is told. It's going to be told as a truth. It's going to be called the noble falsehood, right, trying to persuade even the rulers. So let's look at this passage. It's a lengthy passage. We just want to look at the two crucial paragraphs. So I'm going to look at 414d and continuing on to about 415c. So Socrates says, I'll first try to persuade the rulers and the soldiers and then the rest of the city that the upbringing and the education that we gave them and the experiences that went with them were a sort of dream. That in fact, they themselves, their weapons, and the other craftsmen's tools, were at that time really being fashioned and nurtured inside the earth. And that when the work was completed, the earth, who is their mother, delivered all of them up into the world. Therefore, if anyone attacks the land in which they live, they must plan on its behalf and defend it as their mother and nurse and think of the other citizens as their earth-born brothers. So this is an idea that we've seen in the Credo. Socrates is thinking the city in some way is his mother. And here, right, Plato's explicit, we're going to teach the guardians and the citizens that the city is, in fact, that their, their mother, that their upbringing was a dream, that they were really fashioned by the city itself. So Plato continues, Socrates continues, Plato and the voice of Socrates continues, all of you in the city are brothers. This is what we're going to say to them in our story. But the God made you mixed, right? Some of you have gold and you are adequately equipped to rule because these individuals are the most valuable. He put silver in those who are auxiliaries and iron and bronze in the farmers and other craftsmen. So you get this caste system. There are individuals that have the finest characters. They're the guardians. They're citizens that have um, less than the fine character, but still very good characters. Right? They're going to be the auxiliaries. And then there's going to be the farmers, the productive classes. Right? And they have bronze and iron in their character, not as fine. For the most part, you will produce children like yourselves because you are all related. A silver child will occasionally be born from a golden parent, and vice versa, and all the others from each other. So the first and most important command from the god to the rulers is that there is nothing that they must guard better or watch more carefully than the mixture of metals in the souls of the next generation. So there are a couple interesting things going on here. Plato is concerned about the generational slide into anarchy, and we'll see this later in the Republic. He's recognizing that, you know, like we saw in the Mino, can virtue be taught? Why is it that some individuals who are fine rulers have children who do not have the capacity to rule? Here in the, in the Republic, we get the idea that people have individual characters, right? We can think of them as an analogy with, with, with precious metals. Sometimes parents with very fine characters will produce children that don't have that same fine character, and sometimes it will go the other way around, right? So it's interesting what, what he says here. So the first and most important command from the God, as we just, we're just saying to the rulers, is that there's nothing. They must be on guard better or watch more carefully than the mixture 
of metals in the souls in the next generation. If an offspring of theirs should be found to have a mixture of iron and bronze, they must not pity him in any way, but give him the rank appropriate to his nature and drive him out to join the craftsmen and the farmers. So think about that. That's hard advice. But if an offspring of those people is found to have a mixture of gold or silver, they will honor him and take him up to join the guardians or the auxiliaries. For there is an oracle which says that the city will be ruined if it ever has an iron or bronze guardian. So that is the noble lot. Now it's important for Plato not to just give lip service to the idea that there'll be some mechanism to distribute talent according to the right kinds of positions. He doesn't do this, and this is, a, this is a criticism of his view. But the big picture here to keep in mind is he's thinking we need this myth to be spread out such that it is presented as the truth, and people have this kinship to one another and this, this belongingness to their city. Now it's worth pausing here and asking yourself, what are contemporary noble lies that we are told? What are things that we're told as if they are the truth, but if we reflect and think upon them, we can realize that they serve the control, they serve the purpose of social control. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about that. Email me, put them in your papers if you have any, have any thoughts about that. Okay, so let's look and see how Socrates deals with some objections. So the first objection is that the guardians will not be happy. So this is on 420b. So now we're in book four. Right. And Ademetus right, says, okay, all right, these guardians are all well and good, but they don't have any possessions. Why, why would they be happy? Why would someone want to be a guardian? You can't take a private trip. You can't leave the city. You can't have a wife. You can't have a family, and so on. So Socrates responds, and he says, we'll say it wouldn't be surprising if these people were happiest just as they are, but that in establishing our city, we aren't aiming to make any one group outstandingly happy, but to make the whole city happy or good so far as possible. We thought we'd find justice most easily in the city and injustice by contrast and one that's governed the worst way, and that by observing both cities, we'll be able to judge the question we've been inquiring into for so long. So he's saying, look, we're, we're interested in describing the happy city. We don't want to maximize the happiness of one part. The next question for Plato has to do with civil unrest and preventing civil unrest. Plato assumes that wealth and poverty are the main causes for civil unrest. They talk for a while about wealth and poverty, and it's interesting that Plato says here, right, that in the ideal city, it is only properly called a city, like a single city. So if you look at 423a, he says, you're happily innocent if you think that anything other than the kind of city we're founding, the ideal city, deserves to be called a city. And Ademetus is like, pray tell, Socrates, what, what, what do you mean here? He says, we'll have to find a greater title for the others because each of them is a great many cities, not a city. Interesting, each of these so-called cities. Socrates is thinking, isn't one city, it's just a whole bunch of different cities sort of cobbled together. At any rate, each of them consists of two cities at war with one another, that of the poor and that of the rich, and each of them contains a great many. If you approach them as one city, you'll be making a big mistake. But if you approach them as many and offer to give to the one city the money, power, and indeed the very inhabitants of the other, you'll always find many allies and few enemies. And as long as your own city is moderately governed in the way we've just arranged, it will, even if, even if it has only a thousand men to fight for it, be the greatest. Not in reputation, I don't mean that, but the greatest in fact. Indeed, you won't find a city as great as this one among either the Greeks or barbarians, although many that are many times its size may seem to be as great. So Plato is thinking here that in order to stave off civil unrest, we have to have economic concord. 
And this is going to consist in a well-ordered society where the guardians, those with the authority of the state, the authority of the police, the authority of the military, don't have economic interest. In a way, they have a proper character that they aren't concerned with those. And then the productive classes are properly maintained so that there's economic concord with not one individual having too much and not one individual having too little. So that the kinds of economic conflict that we see and that Marx was sensitive to won't arise in Plato's. All right, so now we begin to get back to the main question, what is justice? And Socrates lays out his strategy here. So 427 E, you can see his strategy, he reasons as follows. He says, the city, as described, is perfectly good. They constructed the ideal city. They didn't leave anything out. So that the assumption is, as they're constructing the ideal city, right, the city that they produce is going to be good. So premise one is supposed to be true, given the method that we've been engaged in from books two up to book four. And he draws the conclusion from that, that because the city is good, it is wise, courageous, moderate, and just. Now this does make a big assumption that the qualities that make a city good, the qualities that constitute the goodness of city, consist in exactly four virtues. Wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice. And so he can then draw the conclusion that if we locate wisdom, courage, and moderation within the city, Whatever is left, whatever is left that makes the city good is going to be justice. So he starts off by identifying wisdom in the city. The discussion there begins in 428b. He says, well, you know, what is it that makes the city good? We can see its wisdom. Where lies, where, where um, does the wisdom of the city lie in? Does it lie in the carpenters that they have knowledge about carpentry? And Socrates and his interlocutors say, no, it lies in the knowledge of how to rule, which is knowledge that the guardians have. So notice what he says there at the end of that conclusion. He says a whole city established according to nature would be wise because of the smallest class, the guardian class, and part in it, namely the governing, our ruling one. And to this class, which seems to be by nature the smallest, belongs a share of the knowledge that alone, among all other kinds of knowledge, is to be called wisdom. So this, this knowledge of how to rule is sort of political wisdom possessed by the guardians. And then they say, okay, well, what about the courage? Where is courage found in the city? And he says below that, 322c, the city is courageous then because a part of itself that has the power to preserve through everything its belief about what things are to be feared, namely that they are the things and kinds of things that the lawgiver declared to be such in the course of educating it. So courage here is a kind of preservation. It's a preservation of what is to be feared. So and then they turn to moderation, and moderation in the city, as he talks about in 430e, is a kind of order, the mastery of certain kinds of pleasures and desires. People indicate it as much when they use the phrase self-control and other similar phrases. Now the Greek word there is sophrosune, and it means, in a way, tempered judgment, good judgment, a sort of self-regulation. It has a has a wider sense of self-control than we would typically uh, think of. So there is a note, um, sophrosune, right, has a wide meaning, self-control, good sense, reasonableness, temperaments, and in some cases, chastity. Someone who has this virtue of moderation is able to keep their head under pressure. So having found the three virtues in the city, wisdom, courage, and moderation, we turn to find where justice is. And Plato says here in 433a that justice is doing one's own work and not meddling with what isn't one's own. So again, we have this one job principle. He says that meddling and exchange between the three classes is the greatest harm that can happen to the city. So you get this idea that justice here is harmony. It's, it's proper balance between the various parts where each part is performing its own task. So he says on 333c that justice is the power that makes it possible for the individuals to grow together in the city and preserves them while they've grown for as long as it remains there. So it enables the entity to hold together, to flourish 
this is what Plato thinks justice is in the city. So we turn now to justice in the soul. So we just saw, after a long discussion, what justice in the city is. Justice in the city is harmony, proper balance between the parts, with each part performing their task, which enables, it's the power that enables right, the city to be unified and to flourish. So now Plato is going to apply this to the individual. And so the first thing he's going to want to do is to argue that within the individual there are a variety of parts and that justice in the individual is going to consist of a harmony of regulation between these parts. So what we get is an argument that the soul has three different parts. So we start with the first premise, right, that conflict in the soul implies different parts opposed to one another. So the idea is like if you see conflict, see one thing pushing this way, and another thing pushing that way, then we can separate those two things, right? There's the push and the pull dynamics, and so there have to be different forces that are operative there. So look, for example, at this passage on 436c. So Plato says, it's obvious that the same thing will not be willing to do or undergo opposites in the same part of itself in relation to the same thing at the same time. So if you have a single entity that doesn't have parts, right, it's not going to undergo a change in opposite. It's not going to be right, hot and cold. It's not going to be you know, colored and not colored. It's not going to be, and it's not going to be calm and agitated. So if we can find this in the soul, then we can we can say that there has to be two different parts right, in the soul. So the next premise right, is that desire is opposed by the calculating part of the soul. So let's look at an example that Plato gives here. So this is on 493a. So he's thinking about this example related to thirst. Hence, the soul of a thirsty person, insofar as he's thirsty, doesn't wish anything else but to drink. And it wants this and is impelled to it. So the thought is here, if, if you have a great thirst, then that's what you, that this desire for thirst, right, is what is impelling you to act a certain way. And then here you get the crucial idea. Therefore, if something draws it back when it is thirsting, wouldn't that be something different in it from whatever thirst and drives it like a beast to drink? So the thought here that Plato has is like if you really have a strong desire to drink. So suppose you want a nice cold glass of lemonade. But suppose also, right, you know that your grandma's lemonade is super sweet and you're trying to regulate your sugar intake. So even though you have this great desire for grandma's lemonade, there is also another part of you and say, you know, I'm gonna, not going to drink lemonade right now. I'm going to take a break. So Plato thinks, okay, well, then we have right, opposites, and so we can separate out desire from the calculating part of the soul. Similarly, Plato reasons that spirit is different from both desire and the calculating part of the soul. So let's look at this example on 439E. I'm going to look in particular at 444D. So he says, what happens if instead he believes that someone has been unjust to him? So we're imagining an individual who thinks someone has committed an injustice, an injustice to him. Isn't the, spirit, isn't the spirit within him boiling and angry, fighting for what he believes to be just? Won't it endure hunger, cold, and the like, and keep on till it's victorious, not ceasing from noble action until either it wins, dies, or calms down? called to heal by reason within him like a dog or by a shepherd. And they say, well, certainly spirit is like that. But notice what Plato did there. Plato is thinking that spirit can endure changes in desire. It's, it's longer lasting, this, this righteous indignation that one has. And so it's different from desire Plato's thinking, and it's also different from reason, because reason can say this this spirited desire, this right, righteous indignation, has been satisfied. So that's the argument, right, that there are three different parts of the soul. 
right? From from those premises, right, then you get the conclusion the parts of the soul are identical in, in number and function to the parts of the city. So you have the, the reasonable part, the calculating part, you have the spirited part, and you have uh, the, the, the part corresponding to desire. So virtue in the individual will be structured in the same way as virtue in the city. So that's, that's the overall argument. We'll think a little bit about this um, some more. So Plato advocates the idea that justice in the soul is harmony. It's harmony among these various parts. So let's look at this passage where he just lays this out very clearly, 443d through e. So he says, And in truth, justice is something of this sort. However, it isn't concerned with someone's doing his own externally, but with what's inside him with what is truly himself and his own. One who is just does not allow any part of himself to do the work of another part or allow the various classes within himself to meddle with each other. So again, you have in this one job principle. Each part of the soul, each part of the person has a specific job to do, and, and justice is going to be the proper alignment of those parts, not one doing another job than the other. He says he regulates well what is really his own and rules himself. He puts himself in order is his own friend and harmonizes the parts of himself like three limiting notes in a music scale, high, low, and middle. He binds together those parts and any others that there may be in between, and from having been many things, he becomes entirely one, moderate, and harmonious. Only then does he act. And when he does anything, whether acquiring wealth, taking care of his body, engaging in politics, or in private contracts, in all of these, he believes that the action is just and fine, that preserves this inner harmony and helps achieve it, and calls it so, and regards as wisdom the knowledge that oversees such actions. And he believes that the action that destroys this harmony is unjust, and calls it so, and regards the belief that oversees it as ignorance. It's a compelling picture of justice as regulation of the individual. Injustice is a kind of civil war where the various parts of one another are at war with each other, where, for example, the emotions are trying to rule, the spirited part of one is trying to rule, or that reason sort of has given up its executive function and just allows an individual to do whatever thought enters into uh, their mind. And so now they turn to this question of whether justice is profitable, and it seems to be dealt with very quickly. We'll get more elaboration of this of course, in the Republic. So it says there at the end, 445 A and B, so let's inquire whether this is profitable. And now Edematus says, well, this inquiry now looks ridiculous to me because we've described what justice is. We, we, we've described what injustice is. Even if one has every kind of food and drink, lots of money and every sort of power to rule, life is thought to be not worth, worth living when the body's nature is ruined. So even if someone can do whatever he wishes, except what will free him from vice and injustice and will make him acquire justice and virtue, how can it be worth living when his soul, the very thing by which he lives, is ruined and in turmoil? So remember, this is supposed to go back to help us answer the question posed in the Ring of Gyges. What will the just person do who has this ring? And the thought here is now that we have a clear picture of what justice is, the just person will realize that reason must maintain the executive function and that they must moderate their desires and moderate the spirited part. So even though they could get away with these actions because they have this ring that turns them invisible, this is not something that they, that reason will say it's okay to do because reason will realize that this will lead to destruction. So that's Plato's account of justice in the soul. We're going to continue to investigate this as we dig deeper into the Republic. At this point, there's some questions that we can have. We can pause and we can say, okay, in what sense, Plato, does the soul have parts? So you've given us this functional argument that there are different elements in the soul, that desire has a different character from the calculating part of the soul. And that there are certain kinds of desires that last longer than short-term desires. So in what sense can we make in what sense does the soul have different parts? So this is a question that you guys can, can wrestle with. You can take a deflationist reading 
of this and just say that Plato is isolating and functionally characterized different parts of the soul. You can take a realist re reading that in some sense or another, right, these are different compartments of the soul. Another question is what is desire? So Plato is not very clear on desire. So when we think of thirst and hunger, right, that's a clear case of desire, but what about pity? His discussion as well of righteous anger, which is supposed to arise from the spirited part of a person, raises this question too about, about how that fits with a more sophisticated conception of desire. Some desires are intellectual desires. We have desires to know. We have desires that have as their objects other individuals. And so we try, try to figure out more carefully, you know, how to think about what desire is. Does desire have a cognitive component to it? I mean, certainly some kinds of desires have cognitive components to it. Another question we might ask is, how, how, how do we think about Plato's conception of justice? Is justice purely formal? Or is it are there some substantive requirements to justice? As we've seen, that justice in the city and justice in the individual is just the proper alignment, the proper regulation of those parts. That doesn't give us any con any substantive principles of justice, not on the face of it. Maybe you know with some argument, uh, we can get that. So you know we learned that certain we learned certain principles of justice, for example, that you must give to individuals what is their due. How does that fall out of a principle, how does that fall out from a conception of justice that Plato is giving us here? That justice is proper alignment between the parts. You might think that it's wrong, it's a violation of justice for one city to attack another city and plunder its goods. How does that fall out of Plato's conceptions of justice in the city? Similarly, we can ask how closely does Plato's conception of justice resemble justice as we often conceive of it? Right? So how do we get these substantive requirements on justice? That it's unjust to take someone's property without remuneration for that property and without their consent. How do we get principles of how do we get principles, you know, for example, that guide medical ethics? that you have to get an individual's consent in order to perform a procedure on them. How does that follow out? How does that follow from this regulation principle? So these are questions that I want you to think about. You might think about these for your final paper.